Chapter 24 Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches An Autobiography by Edwin Eastman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My First Scalp I was roused before dawn by the stir and bustle around me. On rising to my feet, I found the party preparing to march. Every warrior ran out for his horse. The pickets were drawn, and the animals led in and watered. They are bridled. The robes are thrown over them and girthed. We pluck up our lances, sling our quivers, seize our shields and bows, and leap lightly upon horseback. Our line is already formed, and wheeling in our tracks, we ride off in single file to the northward. From conversation with my companions the night previous, I had discovered that only the leaders of the party knew our destination. The rank and file were as ignorant of the intentions of their commanders as is usually the case among the armies of more civilized peoples. The young braves who were my chosen companions on the march and in the camp neither knew nor cared whither we were bound. They expected the expedition to result in our return with an abundance of scalps and plunder and that was all they cared about. During the forenoon, we passed over a moat of prairie or park. Its surface was nearly level, but it was studded here and there with clumps and coppices of cottonwoods and other trees and shrubs. To the north, the horizon was shut in by a lofty mountain chain, which seemingly barred our pathway although at a great distance, and between us and this barrier was a range of much less elevation, such as are called foothills in this region. About noon, we came upon a small stream which crossed our line of march, running off to the eastward. Upon its banks we halted for a short period, watering and feeding our horses, and satisfying our own appetites from our supply of dried meat. This done, we resumed our march. We now found the timber islands became less frequent, and in half an hour's ride we left them altogether behind, and rode for several miles over an open plain. We saw timber ahead of us, and had approached within about a mile of it, when one of the runners, or spies, about fifty of whom were scouting ahead, came back and reported to the chief that they had discovered a small herd of buffalo grazing upon a small prairie or sort of natural clearing beyond the belt of woods. Although we were well provided with dry meat, the prospect of fresh buffalo steak was not unpleasing and a hunt was at once determined upon. Halting the party, Stone Hoan directed the renegade to take his own band and join the scouts ahead. Together, the bands would constitute a hunting party of about 100 warriors, quite large enough for the destruction of the small herd before us. As I had attached myself to the band of Hisodicha, I found myself destined to take part in the enterprise, and anticipated no little amusement and sport. Riding forward cautiously until we reached the timber, which was not very dense chaparral, we rode slowly and silently through the bushes until we encountered a number of scouts cached in the thicket, and evidently waiting for us. What is it, Hanata Moa? asked Hisso de Shaw of the leader of the scouts as they rode up. The scout replied 
that they had found the fresh tracks of a small herd of buffaloes, and on following them up, had found the animals feeding upon a small prairie beyond the chaparral in which we were concealed. The renegade dismounted, and telling me to accompany him, walked forward with the scout to the edge of the thicket. Peering cautiously through the leaves, we had a full view of the open ground. The buffaloes were upon the plain. It was, as Anatomawa had said, a small prairie about a mile and a half in width, closed in on all sides by a thick chaparral. Near the center was a moat of heavy timber growing up from a dense underwood. A spur of willows running out from the timber denoted the presence of water. There's a spring there, said the renegade, turning to me. I have been here before, and know the ground. How can we get at them? he continued, turning to the scout. Do you think we can approach them? No said Hanatamoa. There is not cover enough, and besides, they are getting further away from the bushes as they feed. What then? asked Hisodisha. We can't run them. They would be off through the thicket in a moment, and we would lose them all. Yes, replied the scout. That is certain but we can get them for all that. I never saw a better place for us around, and it will take but a short time to get our braves in position. True, said Hisutecha. If the wind is right, how is it? There is none, said the scout, taking a feather from his headdress and tossing it in the air. You see, it falls direct. I see, said Hisodicha. Let us divide the men. We have enough to pen them in completely. You can guide one half of them to their stands. I will go with the rest. You, Tateka Daher, he continued, had better bring up your horse and stay where you are. It is about as good a stand as you can get. You will have to wait patiently, as it may be an hour before all are placed. When you hear the signal, which will be the hunter's whistle, you may gallop forward and do your best. If we succeed, we shall have plenty of sport and a good supper. And I suppose you are ready for that by this time. The renegade now left me, followed by the scout, and went back to the rest of the party. Their intention was to separate the band into two equal parties, and each taking an opposite direction to place men at regular intervals around the prairie. They would keep in the chaparral while on the march, and only discover themselves when the signal was given. In this way, if the buffaloes did not take the alarm, we should be almost certain of securing the entire herd. As soon as Hisso Decha left me, I selected my hunting arrows, which, unlike those used for war, are not poisoned. Then I brought up my horse, and having nothing else to do, I remained seated upon his back, watching the animals as they fed on, unaware of their danger. The screaming of birds, who flew up from the thicket, showed that the hunters were proceeding to their stands. Now and then, an old bull, standing like a sentinel on the outskirts of the herd, would snuff the wind and strike the ground violently with his hoof, 
as though suspecting that something was wrong. But the others did not seem to mind him and kept on cropping the luxuriant grass. Suddenly, an object made its appearance, emerging from the moat in the center of the prairie. It looked like a buffalo calf proceeding to join the others. As usual, a pack of coyotes were sneaking around the herd, and these, on perceiving the calf, made an instant attack upon it. To my surprise, it seemed to fight its way through them, and soon joined the herd, and was lost to view among them. I thought no more of it, and was wondering how much longer I would have to wait for the signal, when I noticed that the buffaloes were lying down one after another. In a few minutes, eight or ten were stretched upon the turf, and I observed that they fell suddenly, as if shot, and some of them appeared to kick and struggle violently. I had heard of a curious habit of these animals known as wallowing, and concluded this must be it. As I had never witnessed this maneuver, I watched them as attentively as possible, but the high grass prevented me from seeing much. At all events, I thought, the surround will be complete before they get ready to move, and I waited patiently for the signal. The buffaloes still continued to lie down one after another, and at length the last one of the herd stretched himself upon the prairie. At this instant, the shrill notes of the Indian whistle reached my ears, and a wild yell arose from all sides of the prairie. I urged my horse forward. A hundred others had done the same all yelling at the top of their voices as they shot out of the thicket. Filled with the wild excitement incident to such a scene, I galloped forward with my bow strung and arrows ready, intent upon having the first shot. To my surprise, the buffaloes did not stir. The Indians closed in, yelling as they came, and we pulled up our horses in the very midst of the prostrate herd. I sat upon my horse as if spellbound, looking about me in consternation and wonder. Before me lay the bodies of the buffaloes, and I seized with a superstitious awe when I perceived that every one of them was dead or dying. Blood flowed from their mouths and nostrils, and from wounds in the side of each, the red stream trickled down. The prairie carpet was dyed with it. My companion seemed at first as much surprised as myself, but some of the more astute quickly divined the mystery and commenced looking about with keen scrutiny. Suddenly, the renegade urged his horse forward, and on turning to see what he had discovered, I saw the buffalo calf, whose existence I had for a time forgotten. The calf had been concealed behind the carcass of one of the buffaloes, but now appeared to be endeavoring to make off into the timber. Hisso Dicha rode up to it, evidently intending to pierce it with his lance, when the animal suddenly reared up, uttering a wild human scream. The shaggy hide was thrown aside, and a naked savage appeared, holding up his arms as if pleading for mercy. His appeal was a vain one, however, for the ruthless renegade pinned him to the earth with a thrust of his lance, and springing from his horse, finished him with his tomahawk. He then scalped him, and remounting his horse, directed some of the warriors to scour the prairie, as they might find another calf concealed in the long grass. 
With the rest of the party, he rode up to the moat, and they quickly formed in a circle around it. Familiar as I had become with Indian cruelty, I felt a sensation of horror and disgust at this cool shedding of blood, and I halted irresolutely by the body of the dead Indian. He lay stretched upon his back, naked to the breech clout, the red stream flowing from the lance wound in his side. His limbs quivered, but it was in the last spasm of departing life. The hide in which he had been disguised lay near him, where he had flung it at the moment he was discovered. Beside him were a bow and several arrows. The latter were covered with blood, the feathers steeped in it and clinging to the shafts. They had pierced the bodies of the buffaloes, passing entirely through. Each arrow had taken many lives. I was still contemplating the dead man, when a yell from the moat attracted my attention, and I rode thither. I reached the spot just in time to see the body of another Indian dragged out from the thick undergrowth, and his fortunate slayer, who happened to be one of the younger braves, took the scalp with great complacency, as it was his first trophy of the kind. The Indians evidently believed that another of the Coyoteros or Wolf Apaches, for to this tribe the two dead savages were declared to belong, was concealed in the thicket, for they were formed in a sort of irregular circle around the copse, peering into it from every direction. Hisso de Cha now ordered the warriors to close in from every direction and search the thicket. In this maneuver, I found myself compelled to take part, as otherwise I would have incurred the stigma of cowardice. We dismounted from our horses and pressed into the thicket from all sides. For a few seconds, nothing could be heard but the cracking of the undergrowth as we forced our way through it. Suddenly, a yell arose from the side opposite to my position, and almost instantly a third Coyotero sprang from a dense clump of willows near the spring and made for the opening. It chanced that I was directly in his path, and he was rushing upon me with upraised knife. Strong as might be my repugnance to taking human life, the instinct of self-preservation was still stronger, and before he could reach me, I had pierced him with an arrow, and he fell dead almost at my feet. In an instant, the warriors had gathered around me, and I was being congratulated upon my bravery and skill. Not feeling particularly proud of the achievement, I was about to remount my horse when Hisso de Cha reminded me that I had neglected to scalp the fallen foe. So I was compelled to perform that operation, which I did rather clumsily. A thorough search through the thicket and over the prairie having satisfied my savage companions that no more of the Coyoteros had been present, we returned to the dead buffaloes and began skinning and cutting them up. Stone Hawan soon arrived with the remainder of the band, and as it was nearly sundown, we encamped upon the spot. The spring furnishing water, and the grass of the prairie in abundance of rich food for the horses. As for ourselves, we feasted in true savage fashion, finding the fresh steaks, tongues, and hump ribs a decided improvement upon the deseo which had previously been our diet. I was compelled to listen to many encomiums upon my courage and dexterity, and some of the young braves ventured the opinion that, 
Tateka de Hare would soon be as great a warrior as Hiso de Cha. Painfully impressed by the scene of slaughter in which I had been an unwilling participant, I held myself aloof as much as possible from the merry groups around the campfires, and at an early hour wrapped myself in my blanket, and wearied by the fatigue and excitement of the past two days, I was soon buried in a heavy and dreamless sleep, which continued until the dawn of another morning again compelled me to come forth. And this time, it was not as an inexperienced brave, but as an acknowledged warrior, for I had slain an enemy and taken my first scalp. I cannot say, however, that my increase of notoriety was a source of satisfaction to me, but quite the contrary. Somewhat to my surprise, we remained by the moat spring for three days. This was necessary in order to convert the buffalo meat into Taseo, as we had not a sufficient supply for our purpose. On the evening of the third day, the meat being sufficiently cured, we struck camp, and rode off to the north until we had reached the chain of mountains which crossed our path. Here we turned to the eastward, and journeyed along their base intending to cross at a well-known pass about twenty miles above. Reaching it at nightfall, we again encamped, designing to pass the mountain range the next morning. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches An Autobiography by Edwin Eastman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Feast of the Green Corn The Fields or more properly speaking, the patches of corn were quickly ripening, thanks to the arduous efforts of Waka de May and his wonderful arrow, and the whole tribe was waiting impatiently the time when the signal should announce that the feast of the green corn was about to commence. Next to fighting, your Indian likes eating. About one half of his time is employed in catering to the cravings of his stomach. When not engaged in fighting his enemies or marauding in the vicinity of the Mexican border towns, he occupies his energies in the hunt or chase. At the time of my enforced residence among the Apaches, they were not restricted and confined to reservations as at present. They considered themselves masters of the country which they inhabited and were free to roam in any direction their fancy might dictate. When in search of game, they would scour the plains to the northward, and on some occasions would penetrate deep into the country of their enemies, the Crows and Blackfeet. Numerous encounters would result from this intrusion on the rights of others. At times they would meet and repulse their opponents, and continue the hunt, return, laden with the fruits of the chase, and girdles, plentifully garnished with their victims' scalps. At such times, their return home partook of the character of an ovation. Fires would be lighted, food prepared in abundance, and high revelry be the order of the day. Gathered around the council fires, with an eager and attentive multitude of old men, women, and children, constituting themselves an audience. The braves would indulge in the most fantastic and highly colored narratives of their deeds of valor and heroic bearing in the presence of an enemy. Seated in a circle around the blazing fire and smoking their clay pipes, each one in turn would relate the incidents of his particular case reciting the most improbable deeds of valor 
and ending up usually with the oft-told tale of how he gained his sobriquet. His listeners had doubtless heard the same story on many similar occasions, but repetition has no horror for an Indian, and judging from the flattering silence with which his speech is received, and the many complimentary expressions with which he is greeted at its close, one would at once conclude that the remarks were new and original. Boasting is an Indian's weak point. Given a listener, and the amount of bombast and mock heroics which he will inflict on one, simply staggers belief. If, on the contrary, the hunting party has not been successful, but defeat and misfortune has been their portion, then the scene is changed. In place of feasting and revelry, they are greeted with a death-like silence, and as the remnant of the party defile through the village, they are objects of the closest scrutiny by anxious mothers and wives. If the keen eyes of love search in vain for the form of him, who a few weeks before left the village in the glory and vigor of manhood, a heart-rending wail goes up, which is instantly echoed by the assembled women, until the welkin resounds with mournful cries. As on more joyful occasions, a rush is made in the direction of the council lodge and it then becomes the painful duty of the survivors to relate their mishaps, and how such and such and one met the enemy with his accustomed bravery, and foremost fighting fell. In these recitals, the party in question always meet a foe who vastly outnumbers them, and according to their account, their opponents always suffer terribly in slain and would have eventually been overcome and completely routed had not some trifling accident, which could not be foreseen, occurred to mar the effects of their stunning prowess. I have never seen an Indian fight, and am not able to judge of their actions on the field of battle, but if observations of the red man in his home is any criterion, I should venture the opinion that an Apache would fight valiantly under one condition, namely, when his party were numerically stronger than the opposing force. I think they have a just appreciation of the Falstaffian method of conducting warfare, and are firmly convinced that he who fights and runs away has better opportunities for glory, rapacity, and booty another day. As these pages are being written, the country is again startled by the news of fresh Indian outrages, this time against the constituted authority of the country, and close on the heels of the news of the reopening of Indian hostilities, comes the thrilling intelligence that a general has been shot in cold blood, and whilst under the protecting and sacred influence of a flag of truce. Such dastardly and treacherous conduct thrills one with a righteous indignation, and we are more than ever impressed with the belief that measures the most rigorous should be instituted, and that the government should put to one side any feelings of mawkish sentimentality, and met out to these red-handed savages the retribution their deserts merit. The case under consideration is only one among many. How many immigrant trains dragging their slow length over the trackless and boundless prairies have met a similar fate, and their misfortune never so much as heard of. Whole villages on the borders have been attacked, captured, and pillaged, their inhabitants murdered in cold blood or carried off into a captivity that was worse even than the knife of the savage. Who can count the lonely victims who have been waylaid on their toilsome journey by a party 
of howling savages and being surrounded before they were aware almost of the presence of an enemy set upon and brained in the most cruel manner and their bodies left weltering in their own gore a repast for wolves and coyotes horrible reflection to think of the numbers who have suffered this fate and died unknelled uncoffin and unknown while their murderers were these same gentle red children of whose interests the government has exercised such a watchful care guarding them against the rigors of winter by a plentiful supply of food and blankets and during the spring furnishing them with powder and the most improved firearms that they might thereby be enabled to steal forth from their reservations prey on the helpless travelers and returning covered with the blood of their white brothers praise their great father at washington and thank him through their agent for the many inestimable gifts he has placed in their hands by whose judicious use they have gratified their dominant passions and turned many a happy home into a chamber of mourning out upon such a policy war to the bitter end is the only policy that should be for a moment entertained in dealing with these fiends and when they are at last exterminated off the face of the earth it may perhaps be safe for a man to undertake to travel through his own land my readers may think i speak with undue heat on this subject but the memory of my sufferings and trials during the time that i remained among the apaches make it almost imperative that i should speak freely and without reserve those who were at home and surrounded by the protecting influence of a father's or husband's care cannot fully appreciate the perils and degradation consequent upon a life of bondage and i sincerely trust that it may never be their misfortune to undergo similar experiences i must apologize for this lengthy digression and will hereafter endeavor to keep more closely to the thread of my narrative as before stated the indians always made the most extensive preparations for the feast of the green corn and it was looked forward to with the most eager anticipations several weeks before the corn had fairly ripened the head chief and medicine men met in conclave and decided on what measures were to be pursued during the festivities in most instances a few of the older women of the tribe were selected and appointed to watch the patches of corn attentively every morning they were required to pick a few ears of corn and without dividing the husk bring it to the medicine chief itaka pashi pisha the black moccasin who would examine it and if it was not deemed sufficiently ripe they would be dismissed with an injunction to appear again on the following morning with another handful of freshly gathered corn this performance was continued until the samples examined were considered to have arrived at a stage of sufficient ripeness when the fact was announced by criers who went through the village proclaiming the joyful intelligence for several days previous to the announcement of this gratifying news the indians had subjected themselves to a thorough purgation using for this purpose a decoction of various bitter roots and herbs which they termed asiello the black drink this course of treatment enabled them to attack the corn with ravenous appetites and to gorge themselves until they could scarcely move on the appointed day the tribe are all assembled and in the center of the lodge a kettle is hung over a fire and filled with the coveted grain this is well boiled and offered to the great spirit as a sacrifice 
This is an imperative ceremony and must be performed before anyone can indulge the cravings of his appetite. During the time that the cauldron is boiling, four chiefs and mystery men dance around the steaming kettle. They are painted with white clay, and in one hand they hold a stalk of the corn, while with the other they grasp the rattle. As they move around the fire, they chant a weird song of thanksgiving, taking particular pains to remind the great spirit that they are doing all this in his honor, and restraining their appetites that he may be pleased and propitiated to the extent of furnishing them with a bountiful supply during the ensuing season. Whilst the medicine men are performing in this manner, a number of others form in a circle, outside of the inner one, and with stalks of corn in each hand, go through a somewhat similar ceremony. Wooden bowls are placed on the ground immediately under a tripod, formed by joining together three poles of about 12 feet in length, which are also ornamented with ears of corn. In each of the bowls is placed a spoon, made of the horn of the buffalo, or mountain sheep, in which the feast is to be served. The dance is continued until the chiefs decide the corn is sufficiently boiled, when at a given signal, the dance is stopped for a few minutes, and again resumed, this time to a different tune. Then the master of ceremonies removes the smoking vegetable and places it upon a small scaffold of sticks, which they erect over the fire. Having done this, the first fire is removed, and the ashes are gathered and buried. A new fire is then made in the place occupied by the old one. The new one is started by a very painful process. Three men seat themselves on the ground, facing each other, and procuring a hard block of wood, commence drilling violently with a stick by rolling it between the palms of the hand. Each one catches it in turn from the other without allowing the motion to stop until smoke and at last a spark of fire is seen and caught in a piece of punk whereat there is great rejoicing among the bystanders. When this fire is kindled, the kettle is again placed over the fire and refilled with the vegetable. Now the feast begins. An onslaught is made on the contents of the pot, and the Indians rush off in all directions to devour the corn. Soon fires are blazing in every lodge, and all are indulging in the grossest gluttony. This feast lasts until the corn is exhausted, or becomes too hard to eat with any degree of comfort. When an Indian has gorged himself to the fullest capacity, he has recourse to his osceola and is soon in a condition to recommence with as much vigor as at first. These scenes filled me with disgust, and I often thought how happy those brutes would be if they were only endowed with the wonderful attributes of that little sea monster, the polyp, who, when his body is cut in half, suffers no inconvenience, but gormandizes as much as ever, with this advantage that the food, instead of remaining in his stomach, passes out at the other end, thus allowing him to indulge in the pleasure of gluttony without the inconvenience of being gorged. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches An Autobiography by Edwin Eastman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
danger ahead. We started again at early dawn and commenced the passage of the defile through the mountain. The pass was torturous and rugged, but as we rode in single file, we experienced but little difficulty, and after about three hours of alternate ascents and descents, we gained its outlet and debauched upon the plain below. It was a timber prairie, studded with moats of tall cottonwoods, and bisected near its center by a small stream. A heavy belt of timber fringed the northern horizon, and towards this we directed our course. As we were now liable to come in contact with hostile parties of other tribes, Stone Hawan exercised great caution. Nearly a hundred runners or spies were sent in advance, while the main body advanced slowly, the chief receiving frequent reports from the scouts. About ten o'clock we halted on the banks of the Arroyo, and while watering our animals, one of the scouts returned and made some communication to our leader. In a few moments, it became known to the entire band that a large war party of Arapahoes had been discovered ahead. Beyond the belt of timber was a large grass prairie, a favorite haunt of the buffalo, and upon this the Arapahoes had halted to hunt, and after getting a good supply of meat, were engaged in converting it into Taseo preparatory to an extended raid upon the tribes of the southward. It is probable that we, ourselves, were intended to receive their polite attentions, but if this had been their object, it was frustrated by the fact that we were out upon the same errand as regarded themselves. At the eastern extremity of the prairie, a mountain rose from the plain. It was an isolated peak of small altitude, its height being but a few hundred feet, and in shape almost a perfect sugar loaf. The belt of timber which formed the southern boundary of the prairie extended to the mountain and fringed its base. Near the foot of the mountain, the Arapahoes were in bivouac, their horses grazing upon the plain. Long rows of stakes and lines were erected, and upon these the buffalo meat was hung in strips and was fast blackening in the hot sun. Evidently, a few more hours would complete the process of its conversion into Taseo. A number of fires were kindled near the base of the mountain, and around these were grouped the Arapaho warriors engaged in the usual Indian pastime of eating. A more favorable opportunity for attack could not be wished, provided we could approach near enough to take them by surprise. But to effect that promised to be difficult, as we would certainly be seen the instant we passed the timber, and in that case, surprise would of course be out of the question. Our leaders, Stone Hawan and his Hisaducha, stood apart, apparently holding a sort of council of war. Their conference, however, was quickly ended. The renegade made some proposition to which Stone Hawan seemed to assent, for he signed us to mount, and we instantly resumed our march. In a few minutes, I was able to fathom their design from the course taken. Skirting the belt of timber, and screened by it from the views of the Arapahoes, we directed our course towards the Lone Peak. The timber belt was perhaps 200 yards in width, and filled with a dense undergrowth. In its shadow, the spies crept along its northern margin moving parallel to our course and keeping a close watch upon the enemy. 
The renegade's plan seemed to be to approach them as closely as possible under cover of the forest, and then make a sudden dash, taking them by surprise and affecting their utter rout. As events showed, I had judged correctly of the intentions of our leaders, or at least partially so, but there was one detail of the plan which I had not thought of, which was presently put in execution. After riding slowly for about two hours, we reached the point, treaded off to the north, and encircled the mountain. Here, Stone Hawan halted the main body, but the band of Hiso Dicha, which numbered about 60 warriors, was reinforced by about the same number detailed from the chief's party and sent round the mountain to attack the enemy in the rear. I was about running off with this party when Stone Hawan beckoned to me and on my riding up to him, directed me to remain with him. I was quite surprised at this and looked towards Hiso Dicha, expecting that he would urge that I be permitted to accompany him. But to my still greater surprise, he did not seem to notice me at all, and with his band, soon disappeared behind a spur of the mountain. I had little opportunity, however, to reflect upon this circumstance, for our party was quickly put in motion, and passing through the wood, were soon ranged along its outer margin, sheltered from view by the thicket, and awaiting the signal to charge upon the foe. We were barely two hundred yards from their position, and could plainly distinguish the varied hues and designs of the war paint upon their persons. Their number was about equal to our own, and with the advantage of surprise, it seemed probable that we might utterly destroy them. Like hounds held in the leash, we awaited the signal. At last it came. The shrill notes of the war whistle pierced the air, and it was instantly followed by the wild intonation of the Comanche war whoop as we burst forth from the timber and charged with headlong fury upon the foe. For a moment, I thought that the surprise would be complete, for our sudden appearance seemed likely to completely demoralize the enemy. But the Arapahoes, although greatly surprised and alarmed at our sudden onslaught, showed no signs of panic. Indeed, it is next to impossible to really surprise an Indian. A few of those that were nearest to us were ridden down, transfixed with lances, or brained by blows from our war clubs and battle axes. But the larger number, hastily plucking up their lances and seizing their other weapons, rushed for their horses, and before we could reach them were mounted and forming to receive us. Riding at a headlong pace, a few seconds brought us upon them, and we closed at full speed. A confused and deadly melee followed, the combat being mainly hand-to-hand. -hand. Blows and lance thrusts were exchanged, arrows whistled through the air, Ghastly wounds were given and received. The air resounded with the groans of wounded and dying men and the wild war cries of the contending warriors. Exactly what I did I hardly know, so great was the excitement and confusion. I know that I gave and received blows and mechanically defended myself from the attacks made upon me. But the incidents of that brief yet terrible struggle seem like a dream to me now. The impetus of our first charge had carried us entirely through the enemy's line. We then wheeled and charged them anew, and this maneuver was repeated many times. 
Our adversaries seemed to be getting decidedly the worse of the conflict, and we could see unmistakable signs of an inclination on their part to take refuge in flight, when something seemed to suddenly change their determination, and they again assaulted us with renewed fury. We were not long in discovering the cause. During the fight, we had many times changed positions with our adversaries, and we were now facing towards the mountain. Attracted by a noise in our rear, we glanced in that direction to behold a sight that filled us with dismay. Approaching us at full speed was a party of fully 100 Arapahoes, evidently a detachment from the band we were fighting. Coming from the north, they had got within a quarter mile of us before we had discovered them, the tumult and confusion of the conflict preventing us from perceiving them sooner. As Hisso de Cha and his party, from some unaccountable delay, had not arrived upon the ground, our position was a perilous one. In a moment, the new enemies would be upon us and without doubt we would be overwhelmed. Instant action on our part was imperative, and our leader, with ready perception of that fact, gave the signal to close in together and charge upon our immediate opponents. With a wild yell we rushed upon them, breaking through their line and retreating rapidly towards the base of the mountain. Here, a number of large rocks had fallen upon the plain from the cliffs above and laid in such positions as to form a sort of natural breastwork. Indeed, the masses of rock from their peculiar formation and grouping had a striking resemblance to the ruins of some vast building. Behind these rocky bulwarks, we sheltered ourselves and prepared to receive the attack which we felt sure the Arapahoes, strengthened by their opportune reinforcement, would certainly make upon us. Indeed, we could see that they were preparing to do so, and I, having by this time had quite enough of fighting, was awaiting the assault with dread, when I was suddenly called by Stone Hawan. Hastening to his side, as he sat on his horse, he directed me to accompany one of the young braves who was standing by him and had apparently received his instructions. These the chief repeated for my benefit. We were to ascend the mountain with all possible speed and send up from its summit a signal smoke to hasten the arrival of Hisso de Cha and his party. Still, unaccountably delayed. Leaving our horses and most of our weapons with the party, we set off at once. The wild yells of the Arapahoes, as they advanced to the attack, ringing in our ears, and being echoed by the defiant war cry of the Comanches, as the latter prepared to receive the onslaught. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches An Autobiography by Edwin Eastman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Escape Turning in the Direction of the Mountain we put our horses into a hard run, and in a few moments were tearing our way through the mesquite bushes that fringed its base. The undergrowth became denser as we advanced, and it was found advisable to abandon the ponies and forge ahead on foot. The safety of our party depended in a great measure on the celerity of our movements. 
hastily dismounting and tying the cattle to some sturdy sage bushes, we continued our ascent, and it was not many minutes before we had reached a portion of the mountain that shelved out over the ravine, thus forming an admirable position for the signal operations. My companion briefly explained the method of smoke signals, which were made by gathering a quantity of very dry underbrush for the fire, and green twigs, boughs of pine, balsam, and hemlock being placed upon the blazing wood, covers the flame and throws off a dense smoke that may be seen at great distances. After ascertaining his views and receiving my instructions, I plunged into the wood and busied myself collecting materials for our telegraph operations. It was not long before we had a sufficient quantity of material gathered, and placing the dry wood in such a manner that it might be easily ignited, my companion produced his tinder apparatus, and was soon at work drilling the block of hard wood, and frantically endeavoring to coax a spark that might set the pile in a blaze. As few, if any, of my readers understand the method by which Indians light their fires, I will hastily describe it. The Indian is unfamiliar with the use of matches. Even the more primitive flint and steel is a sealed book to him. Hence, he resorts to a very simple but laborious contrivance. Each Indian supplies himself with two dried stalks of the Mexican soap plant, about three-fourths of an inch in diameter. One is made flat on one side. Near the edge of the flat surface, a small indentation is made to receive the point of the other stick, and a groove cut from this down the side. The other stick is made with a rounded end, and placed upright upon the first, placing the stick with a flat surface between the feet. The point of the other is placed in the hole made to receive it, and turning it between the palms with a backward and forward motion, and pressing the point forcibly into the lower stick, a fine powder is made, which runs through the groove and falls on the ground. By constant and rapid motion the wood begins to smoke, and at length the fine particles take fire. The spark is soon nursed into a flame, and the brush wood ignited. In this manner our fire was lighted, and heaping up the pine and hemlock boughs, the surrounding atmosphere was one dense cloud of smoke. Stealing to the very edge of the cliff, I peered over and anxiously scanned the plain below. I could see Stone Hawan's band fighting desperately with their foes, who by their superior numbers were overpowering the Comanches. Immediately behind the belt of timber, and to the left of the contending factions, was the party comprising the band under the leadership of his so de Cha. They were moving cautiously around the timber, and had not as yet observed the signal. Once more the signal was worked, this time sending up a denser cloud than before. It was observed by the ambushed party. They drew rein, and after a hasty consultation, turned and retraced their steps. The movement was not executed any too soon, as the main party were retreating before the successful assault of the enemy, and endeavoring to gain the friendly cover of the wood. Hisso de Cha pressed rapidly forward, and emerging on the plain, swooped down upon the flank of the victorious Arapahoes. This sudden movement entirely changed the aspect of affairs. The Arapahoes fell back precipitately in the direction of the ravine, hoping by the means to gain shelter, and if the worst came to the worst, disband and scatter over the mountain. 
It was a thrilling scene, and I almost wished I was one among them. Our mission was accomplished, and my companion intimated that we should descend the mountain and join the war party. As we descended, the Comanche preceded me, pushing his way through the bushes with a rapidity only acquired by long practice. Suddenly, the thought flashed across my mind that now, if ever, was my golden opportunity. What would there be to prevent my braining the Indian in his tracks and then escape? It was a savage and brutal alternative to be sure, but it was my only chance, and I might wait years in vain before another opportunity would present itself. As I resolved this scheme in my mind, my hand went instinctively to my belt and grasped the tomahawk. I trembled with excitement, and as if to keep pace with my thoughts, my steps quickened, and a few strides brought me close upon my victim. My quick and labored breathing must have attracted his attention, as suddenly wheeling, he confronted me, and evidently read the murderous intention in my eye. He sprang lightly to one side, and unsheathing his knife, stood as if expecting an attack. Simultaneously with this action, I drew my tomahawk and rushed upon him, aiming a blow at his head. He adroitly parried with his arm, but in doing so received a severe wound in the shoulder. Darting at me, he clutched my arm, and twining his limbs about my person, made a desperate endeavor to bring me to the ground. The tomahawk was of no use now. I allowed it to fall from my grasp, and with the disengaged hand clutched my knife. My antagonist's superior strength began to tell. I felt powerless, and his eyes gleamed with fiendish triumph. He raised the shining blade, preparatory to sheathing it in my body when I suddenly felt the ground giving way beneath my feet, and in less time than it takes to relate it, we were rolling over a precipice with a sheer fall of about ten feet. The savage clung to me with a death-like grip, and encircling my neck with his arm, grasped my throat with his teeth. Those were fearful moments. I struggled to disengage my hand from his vice-like grip. The blood gurgled from my mouth, my tongue protruded, and I was gasping for breath in the last throes of strangulation when we came to the ground with a terrific shock. The savage gave one yell that curdled my blood and instantly relaxed his hold, falling limp and lifeless by my side. I was not many minutes in disengaging myself from my antagonist, and in doing so, I was made aware of the cause of the sudden turn of events that had saved me from a horrible death. It would appear that during the struggle and fall, the hand that grasped my knife was encircled around the body of my foe, and when we struck the ground, my body being uppermost, the knife had been driven to the hilt into his back by the force of the concussion. Everything now depended on the celerity of my movements. The remainder of the party would no doubt wonder at our long absence, and dispatch runners to seek the missing signal makers. It would require but a glance at the prostrate form of their comrade to enable them to realize the true state of affairs, and to make instant preparations to follow, overtake the fugitive, 
and met out to him the reward of his perfidy. Hastily possessing myself of what few arms I needed, and taking the bag of parched corn that was suspended from the girdle of the fallen savage, I made my way to where the ponies were cached, and springing on my animal, urged him forward at the top of his speed, leading the Indian's pony by the lariat attached to his bridle. My plan was to strike out over the prairie in a southerly direction, and by traveling without cessation, endeavor to put a wide gap between pursuer and pursued, and thus be unable to reach in safety some of the Mexican frontier towns. I was certain that this plan was feasible, from the conversation I had heard from time to time among the warriors of our band. Indeed, it was proposed by Hiso de Cha to raid on some one of the Pueblas, if they were unsuccessful in their attack on the Arapahoes, as by this means they would avoid the ignominy of returning to the lodges of their people without being able to display the fruits of a successful foray, such as scalps, horses, captives, etc. By riding my pony until he dropped from exhaustion and then availing myself of the fresh lead horse, I could travel an immense distance without drawing rain. It was growing dark when I started, and I had not traveled far before the night closed in, and I had to trust to the instinct of my horse to carry me safely over the prairie. My course was shaped by a certain star that would keep me on the right trail if I held it steadily in view. About midnight, I halted at a small stream to water the horses, and hastily prepare for myself a small portion of the parched corn, which was done by mixing a handful in a gourd filled with water. This corn is invaluable to those who wish to traverse long distances without being hampered with unnecessary luggage. With a sack or gourd of this article, containing about an half bushel, one can travel 15 or 20 days without other sustenance. On we sped, the animals straining every muscle and nerve, their flanks heaving and flecked with foam. No sound broke upon the stillness of the night, save the rapid hoof strokes of the mustangs, and occasionally the yelp of a coyote that was startled in his midnight prowlings by our sudden and rapid advance. Directly in my course loomed up a huge mound, and further on the dark forms of a range of low hills were outlined upon the horizon. I concluded to push on and gain their shelter. Once within their protecting shadow, I could pursue my course more leisurely and without the fear of immediate detection. My grand anxiety was to hide or blind the trail and by this means baffle the sleuth hounds, who were by this time in full pursuit. I had not proceeded far when the pony came to a sudden halt, which almost unseated me. I tried to urge him forward by word and action, but it was of no avail. He refused to move and stood trembling like an aspen. Leaning forward and peering over his neck, I discovered to my dismay a wide chasm which fully explained why the Mustang had refused to be urged forward. The banks on either side were quite level, and no indentations or ruggedness marked the line of separation. One could ride up to its very brink without being aware of a break in the prairie level. I had thus come upon one of those barrancas, the result of volcanic action that are so frequently met within this country. There was no alternative but to ride along its edge until I came to a point where its sides were depressed to the level of the plain. This, of course, involved a long detour, 
and a consequent loss of valuable time. My only consolation was in the reflection that my enemies, in following the trail, would be compelled to resort to the same tactics. I had journeyed down its banks about three miles before I found an opportunity to cross. As I reached the opposite side, I turned and looked back. Away to my right, and in the direction from whence I came, I discerned a number of dark specks on the horizon, which filled me with the direst apprehensions. These dark objects were, doubtless, the forms of my pursuers, who had, it would seem, traveled with a celerity almost equaling my own. The chase now assumed a desperate aspect. Before me lay life, hope, and freedom. Behind was a nemesis that represented captivity, torture, and death. I plied the whip vigorously to the flank of my jaded steed in the frantic endeavor to reach the cover of the mountain. I had not proceeded far on my course when my pony showed unmistakable signs of giving out. Indeed, I had not made more than a mile on my course when the animal stopped abruptly. I could feel him tremble under my weight, and dropping on his knees, I had scarcely time to leap to the ground before he fell, and drawing a deep sigh, he turned on his side and died being absolutely ridden to death. I had no time to waste in mourning the brave little animal that had carried me thus far so faithfully. My robe was quickly transferred to the other horse, and the flight resumed. Reaching the base of the hills, I was so fortunate as to find water, and throwing myself at the foot of a tall cottonwood, with the lariat of the Mustang attached to my wrist, I determined to snatch an hour's rest, of which both my Mustang and myself were very much in need, after our long and arduous ride. I was awakened by a violent pulling at my wrist, caused by the horse, and trying to reach fresh grass. In a few moments I was up, mounted, and away once more in the direction of the Mexican towns. Towards evening, I came to a river of some magnitude. It was now the dry season, and the stream was only a rivulet compared to what I judged it must be when swollen by the rains and melting snows from adjacent mountains. I had, during the latter part of my journey, been casting about in my mind a series of plans which would enable me to blind my trail, when lo! Here was an opportunity that surpassed my most sanguine expectations. To urge my horse into the stream was the work of a moment, and then, turning his head with the current, I continued the journey. At times, the water would brush the animal's flanks. Again, it would suddenly shallow and scarcely cover his fetlocks. Occasionally, I would strike a deep hole and be obliged to swim the animal some rods before reaching terra firma. These irregularities in the riverbed were due to its quicksand formation, which was constantly shifting, shallowing here, deepening there, and it would have been sure destruction to horse and rider if we stopped for a moment in our tracks. After journeying in this manner for about a mile, I entered a cannon, whose walls ascended to a height of thousands of feet, perpendicularly. On emerging from this gloomy pass, a sight met my gaze that made me shout for joy. Gaining the bank of the stream, I saw extended before me waving fields of grain, and in the background the modest spire of a little church, which was surmounted by a gilt cross that fairly scintillated under the rays of the noonday sun. I had arrived then, 
at last within the confines of civilization, and my career as a savage was about to be abruptly terminated. As I pushed forward along the road that skirted the grain fields, and the familiar sounds of former days fell upon my ears. The tinkle of the cowbells, the busy hum that filled the air like the whisper of early recollections, wafted down through the airy halls of time, made the scenes, trials and sufferings, appear but a horrid dream, and I seemed to be just waking to reality. A glance at my tattooed and painted form, however, soon brought me back to a realizing sense of my position, and set me to reflecting how I should explain my presence in this hostile guise to any chance inhabitant whom I might meet. After much cogitation on the subject, I concluded it would be best to ride boldly into the village, and seeking the alcade, explain my situation in as good Spanish as my limited knowledge of the tongue would permit. I had not gone far when I was encircled by a crowd of bewildered and frantic Mexicans who were shouting, Indios! Los Indios! at the top of their squeaky voices. While I made a running accompaniment to their remarks by holding up my hands with a palm outstretched towards them and shouting in my turn, Amigo! Reaching the plaza, I dismounted entered the cantina and called for a basin of water. Stripping the plumage from my head and relieving my body of its meretricious adornment, I plunged into the bath prepared for me and came out an entirely different-looking individual. The news of my arrival had collected an eager and enthusiastic multitude who filled the patio. I said enthusiastic, but all due allowance must be made for the natural and inherited indolence of the Mexican. On emerging from the inn, I was greeted with several shouts, and fifty people were asking me questions in one breath, all bent on having them answered in less than no time. I finally succeeded in relating my history, adventures, and escape, and wound up with an appeal to their charity setting forth my utterly destitute condition in the most glowing terms my exasperable Spanish would permit. It was an animated scene. The men in the checkered serape or striped blankets, conical sombreros with broad brims, calzoneros of velveteen with rows of shiny buttons and a sash of gaudy color encircling their waists. The women were no less conspicuous draped in the graceful sabazo, the short vagna, and the finely embroidered camisette. My appeal was not met with that spontaneous generosity that I could have wished. In fact, they contributed nothing, and as a last resort, I was compelled to offer my horse for sale, which venture was more successful, and I soon disposed of him at a very fair price. I was now enabled to buy the few articles of clothing that I was most in need of, and after lingering a few hours in the village, I concluded to push on toward Santa Fe, in the hope of falling in with some party of traders or miners, and then trust to the chapter of accidents for the rest. Fortune favored me in my designs, as I soon had an opportunity to join a party of Mexicans, who were en route for the capital of New Mexico, on trading schemes and tent. I accompanied them in the capacity of muleteer. Arriving in Santa Fe, I immediately repaired to the largest inn, being attracted thither by a number of uncouth characters in hunting shirts and slotch hats. I entered unobtrusively and took a quiet survey of the scene. The room was the cantina and all were indulging in potations more or less deep of El Paso whiskey. The atmosphere was redolent of the fumes of tobacco, and commingled with the shouts and coarse language of the men was the shrill treble of the woman, 
who darted here and there through the throng like sunbeams. I was attracted by one rude specimen who seemed bent on getting up a fight. This great rough fellow of six feet and over called a trim little poblana to him with, Hey, yar, my little masacha, vamoose, and get me some of that or pass. Good now, and clar. Then, as the liquor was produced, he offered the waiter a quantity of money, which was unhesitatingly accepted, with a mucho bueno, senor. Hoorah for you! Come along! Let's liquor up all around and have a dance. You're the gal for my beaver, bully for old Missouri. Suddenly, a pistol was discharged in a remote corner of the room, and there was an instantaneous rush in that quarter, succeeded by loud cries, oaths, blows, shooting, din, and confusion. Sick and weary of such scenes, I left the cantina, and sallying forth into the plaza, wandered down the street, not knowing where to go or what was to become of me. I cared less. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches An Autobiography by Edwin Eastman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A New Departure Glad to escape from such a scene of riot and violence, I walked rapidly along the narrow street without any definite idea of where I was going. I soon passed the low and squalid-looking rows of adobe buildings, which composed the greater part of the famous Quidad de Santa Fe, and came out upon the open plain beyond. My attention was attracted by a small group of wagons parked upon the plain a short distance off, and I walked towards them, thinking perhaps to fall in with some of my own countrymen of a different class from the brutal roughs I had lately met. The wagons were but four in number, and the party to which they belonged comprised only twelve or fifteen persons. They were mostly Americans, and from their dress and manner I took them to be a party of miners. All were stout, hardy-looking men, with an air that bespoke familiarity with hardships and adventure. They had just struck camp and were evidently preparing for departure. One, who seemed to act as their leader, was directing operations and apparently exercised a degree of authority unusual among men of this class. He was a stout, broad-shouldered man with a good-natured expression of countenance, and from his voice and features, easily distinguishable as an Englishman. The others addressed him as Harding or Ned, one or two giving him the familiar appellation of Hard Pan, which seemed a sort of sobriquet by which he was known. There was something in his appearance which inspired me with the belief that in him I might find a friend, and impelled by this feeling I approached him and addressed him as Mr. Harding, explained that I was a stranger and destitute in what was to me a strange land, and implored him to give me employment of some kind with his party, so that I might in time be enabled to return to my home in the distant east. "'Where do you come from, lad?' said he, looking at me with some interest, and noticing the ineffaceable marks upon my face, my legacy from the Comanches, and which I am destined to carry to my grave. In as few words as possible, I told him my story, interrupted by many exclamations of wonder and sympathy from my simple-minded listener. 
As I concluded, he slapped me on the back and declared that I should join his party and should never want for a bite or sup while Ned Harding was to the fore. By this time, the other men of the party had gathered around, and I was compelled to repeat my tale, which excited both pity and interest in the breasts of the kind-hearted miners, who declared that the Cuss Comanche ought to be wiped out. Aye, every mother son of them, added Ned, for playing such tricks upon travelers, the bloody-minded heathen. It was soon agreed upon that I should accompany the party, who were on their way to the old Spanish mine of San Ildefonso, formerly noted as one of the richest in the province of New Mexico, but for many years deserted by the Mexicans from terror of the savage Apache and Navajo. The men composing the party of which I had now become a member were not to be deterred in their search for a golden harvest by any fears of such a nature, and had determined to visit the old mine and prospect in its vicinity, with the hope of finding a paying lead. They had with them all the necessary utensils for their purpose, were well armed, and with an abundant stock of provision, and seemed one and all to be confident of success in their enterprise. I will spare the reader unnecessary details, and merely state that we started within an hour on our journey, and after a wearisome and uninteresting trip of eighteen days, reached the scene of our future operations, and which was destined to be my abiding place for nearly two years. A suitable spot was selected, convenient to both wood and water. A few rude huts were erected, and the town of Harding sprang into being. After getting fairly settled, and resting somewhat from the fatigue incident to our journey and our labors in preparing our camp, we divided in parties of three and four, and went to prospecting in various directions for the precious metal, which was the object of our expedition. In this, we were moderately successful, and we soon had our mining operations in full blast. I always worked in company with Ned, as I had learned to call him, and although he favored me to a degree, assigning to me all the lighter portions of the work, I soon found that it was the most severe labor I had ever undertaken, although I had been inured to toil and hardship of almost every kind during my long residence with the Comanches. The old mine was situated at the base of a precipitous cliff of quartz rock. A number of rude shafts pierced the mountainside. Some had penetrated to a considerable depth, others more shallow, showing that the lead had proved unprofitable and been speedily abandoned. On the banks of a little stream which wound around the base of the cliff stood the old smelting house and ruined ranches of the Mexican miners. Most of them were roofless and crumbling to decay. The ground about them was shaggy and choked up. There were briars, mescal plants, and many varieties of cactus all luxuriant, hirsute, and thorny. These were speedily cleared away, and selecting one of the largest of the old smelting houses, we soon put in order for work. Besides our quartz mining in the old shafts, and in new ones which we opened, we also engaged in gulch and surface mining in the vicinity. As some account of the different modes employed to get at the precious metals, with which the rocks and soils of the far western states are so richly stored, may not be uninteresting to the reader, I will briefly give it. Mining for gold alone is divided into two general classes, that which seeks the metal from the solid rock or quartz, and that which finds it in sand, gravel, or soil. 
The former process is the universal and familiar one of all rock mining. Following the rich veins into the bowels of the earth with pick and powder, crushing the rock and separating the infinitesimal atoms of metal from the dusty, powdered mass. The theory of the geologist is that this is the original form or deposit of the precious metals, that the gold found in gravel, sand, or soil, lying as it does almost universally in the beds of rivers or under the caves of the mountains, has been washed or ground out of the hard hills by the action of the elements through long years. Washing with water is the universal means of getting at these deposits of the gold. But the scale on which this work is done, and the instrumentalities of application vary from the simple hand pan, pick and shovel of the original miner, operating along the banks of a little stream, to grand combination enterprises for changing the entire course of a river running shafts down hundreds of feet to get into the beds of long-ago streams, and bringing water through ditches and flumes, and great pipes for ten or twenty miles, and withal to wash down a hillside of gold and gravel, and extract its precious particles. The simple individual pan washers are the first in the field, but it soon ceases to be profitable in this class of operators and they soon move on in search of richer diggings. The other means are employed on greater or less scales of magnitude, by combinations of men and capital. All the forms of gold washing run into each other indeed, and companies, sometimes consisting of only two or three persons, with capitals of a few hundred dollars merely, buy a sluice claim, or seize a deserted bed, and with shovel and pick, and a small stream of water, run the sands over and over through the sluiceways, and at the end of the day, or week, or month, gather up the deposits of gold in the bottoms and at the ends of their sluices. From this, operations ascend to a magnitude involving hundreds of thousands, and employing hundreds of men as partners or day laborers for the managers. Sometimes, too, the enterprise is divided, and companies are organized that furnish the water alone, and sell it out to the miners or washers according to their wants. The raising of auriferous sands and gravel from the deeply covered beds of old streams, by running down shafts and tunnels into and through such beds, is called deep diggings, or bedrock diggings, and in their pursuit, the bottoms of ancient rivers will be followed through the country for mile after mile, and many feet below the present surface of the earth. The miners in this fashion go down until they reach the bedrock along which the water originally ran, and here they find the richest deposits. The other sort of heavy gold washing, employing powerful streams of water to tear down and wash out the soil of hillsides that cover or hold golden deposits is known as hydraulic mining. This is the most unique and extensive process, involving the largest capital and risk. The water is brought from mountain lakes and rivers, through ditches and flumes, sometimes supported by trestle work, 50 or 100 feet high, to near the scene of operations. Then it is let from the flumes into large and stout iron pipes, which grow gradually smaller and smaller. Out of these it is passed into hose, like that of a fire engine, and through this it is discharged with terrific force into the bank or bed of earth, which is speedily torn down and washed with resistless separating power into narrow beds or sluices in the lower valleys. And as it goes along these, the more solid gold particles deposit themselves in the rifts or slight barriers placed for that purpose across its path. Usually, in large operations of this kind, 
The main stream of water is divided in the final discharging hose into two or more streams, which spout out into the hillside as if from so many fire engines, but with immensely more force. One of these streams would instantly kill man or animal that should get before it, and fatal accidents frequently happen from this source. Sometimes, a water company taps lakes 15 or 20 miles off in the mountains and turns whole rivers into its ditches. There are in some localities supposed rich gold banks and beds, which only require water for development, but to get which would require an outlay for ditches of many hundred thousand dollars. It is probable that it would be richly paying investment, however, and the principal reason why it is not undertaken is the lack of certain laws regulating mining claims and the conflicts and doubts that are occasioned by the neglect of the government to establish the terms of ownership in mining lands. As it is now, possession is the principal title to mining properties. Prospectors and miners have established a few general rules for determining the rights of each other and they can occupy the properties that they discover or purchase to a certain limited extent. No one person is permitted to take up more than a certain amount in feet or acres. The government so far has done nothing with these mineral lands, whose real ownership is still in itself, and derives no revenue from them. Whenever difficulties arise and are brought before the courts, the regulations of the miners of the district where the properties are located has generally been sustained. But the apprehension that the government will yet assume its rights and establish different rules for the possession and use of these lands, and the uncertainty and controversies growing out of the present loose ways of making and holding claims are a serious obstacle to large enterprises and a hindrance to the best sort of mining progress and prosperity throughout all the western mining country. The profits obtained in some cases of extensive deep diggings and hydraulic mining are very great. A thousand dollars a day is often washed out by a company holding rich soil and employing a large force. And a run of several weeks averaging from fifty to one hundred dollars a day for each man employed is frequently recorded. A single cleaning up after a few weeks washing in a rich place has produced fifty thousand dollars in gold dust and nuggets, and in some cases even one hundred thousand dollars has been reported. These are the extreme cases of good fortune, however. Other enterprises are run at a loss, or with varying results, but the gold washing, as a general thing, pay good wages, and a fair return to the capital invested. It is hardly possible to imagine, and wholly impossible to describe the ruin and wreck to be seen everywhere in the path of the larger gold washing operations. Streams naturally pure as crystal become changed to a thick yellow mud from this cause early in their passage out from the hills. Many of them are turned out of their original channels, either directly for mining purposes or in consequence of the great masses of soil and gravel that come down from the gold washing above. Thousands of acres of fine lands along their banks are ruined forever by deposits of this character. The mining interest respects no rights but its own. A farmer may have his whole estate changed to a barren waste by a flood of sand and gravel from some hydraulic mining up the stream. If a fine orchard or garden stands in the way of the working of a rich gulch or bank, orchard and garden are doomed. They are torn down, dug out, washed to pieces, and then washed over side hills. Where the process of hydraulic mining has been, 
or is being carried on, the country presents an appearance of devastation and ruin that is scarcely imaginable, forming a frightful blot upon the face of nature. For this sort of mining on a large scale, we had no facilities, so we were compelled to work in a very small way and be satisfied with correspondingly small results. News of our successful establishment of the old mine in some way reached Santa Fe, and rushing to the conclusion that we had found a new El Dorado, all the floating population of that decaying city swooped down upon us, and we soon found quite a populous settlement growing up around us. A very decided change in our situation resulted from this, and some rather exciting events transpired, but these I will leave for another chapter. Soon after the accessions to our community had become so numerous, my friend and partner, Ned Harding, fell ill. This put a sudden stop to our mining operations, and for several weeks I was compelled to remain by the side of his rude couch, attending to his wants, and doing all that I could to facilitate his recovery. Among the new arrivals at our diggings was a Mexican, who had followed the profession of a medico in former times, but who was now an inveterate gold hunter, one of the sort who are perpetually on the move from place to place, seeking placers of fabulous richness, but never working any claim long enough to fairly develop it. Perhaps they have no sooner commenced operations in one place when a rumor comes of rich finds at some far distant point and off they go to repeat the same performance indefinitely. When Ned was first taken sick, I thought of this Mexican doctor and at once went in search of him. With some difficulty, I persuaded him to get out of the hole in which he was working and go to see my friend. We had a few simple medicines among our supplies, and from some of these the ex-doctor prepared a potion for Ned, which he declared would be mucho bueno, and that the patient would be all right in tres dias at the most. The result, however, failed to justify his expectations, for Ned became no better although there was no marked change for the worse. It went on this way for several weeks, I continuing to give the medicines prescribed by the Mexican physician, but without any apparent result. Ned seemed to be in a kind of low fever and to constantly lose strength. The stomach seemed to entirely refuse its office, and it was almost impossible to give him any food, however light, that he could keep down much longer than while eating it. He complained greatly of pain in the back and head, and a constant feeling of nausea at the stomach, or, as he expressed it, I tell ye, lad, there's something there as wants to come up and can't. Finally, Seeing no signs of improvement from the treatment pursued by our Mexican friend, and becoming greatly alarmed at Ned's condition, I was sitting one day in great despondency upon a stump in front of our hut, when it suddenly flashed upon my mind that I had never tried the Indian remedy, in the preparation and administration of which I had spent so great a part of my life. For some reason, it had never occurred to me to use it, and indeed, I did not know whether it was possible to procure the necessary ingredients in my present location, although I judged it probable that I might do so. At all events, I determined to make the attempt, and accordingly, I went prospecting for the required herbs, roots, etc. that very day. After two days spent in this way, I succeeded in procuring all the ingredients which I had so many times compounded under Wako Mekla's direction, and lost no time in preparing the medicine. I then commenced giving it to my patient in small doses, 
at intervals of four or five hours through the day and was soon gratified to find an almost immediate improvement in his condition. The second day after commencing this treatment, the fever left him. He broke out into a profuse perspiration and fell into a deep sleep, which lasted for many hours. When he awoke, he complained of feeling very hungry, and when I prepared some food he ate quite heartily, and retained it on his stomach without difficulty. Encouraged by these favorable indications, I continued the medicine, and with surprising results. His recovery was so rapid that it seemed almost miraculous. In eight days he declared himself entirely well, and almost overwhelmed me with expressions of gratitude, declaring that I had saved his life. I told him that his thanks were due not to me, but to Wako Mekla, the strange old medicine man of the Comanches, or more properly, to that higher power which had enabled this uneducated savage to discover and prepare from the simple groves of the forest and mountain so wonderful a remedy for all the ills that flesh is heir to. Ned was so universal a favorite among the miners that his illness had excited great sympathy and commiseration. As he went about trumpeting forth my praise as a medical practitioner, I soon found that I had gained considerable notoriety. The miners dubbed me doctor and called for my services in all cases requiring medical assistance. With Wako Mekla's remedy alone as my entire pharmacopoeia, I battled with many forms of disease incident to our rough and exposed life and met with almost unvarying success. In fact, in that region, I expect I shall never be known by any other title than doctor, although I do not claim or fancy such a designation. It would be well for the people if the old school mineral physicians, who are rapidly ruining the health of the entire nation by the free use of deleterious and poisonous drugs, would take a leaf from the book of nature and re-study their profession in the same school from which I graduated, the School of Nature. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches An Autobiography by Edwin Eastman this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Vigilance With the influx of population to our settlement came adventurers of all classes. Desperados, gamblers, broken-down professional men nymphs de poivre of the coarse and vulgar sort, gentlemen who had interest in wildcat mines in half the counties of the Pacific states, greasers or Mexicans, Indians, Pueblas, in short, a conglomerate mass of humanity, or, judging by later events, one might rather say, inhumanity such as is nowhere to be seen but the mining towns of the far west. Under the instructions of Ned Harding, we had on our first arrival located all the claims that there was any probability of our working, and we were therefore secured against interference on the part of the newcomers, who went prospecting all over the adjacent country, locating claims by the hundred. As the process of locating claims may be new to the reader, I will give a brief description of it. The first thing is to find your lead, for this precious metal is not found indiscriminately in every rock or ledge you may chance upon. It is found only in the quartz rock, a ledge of which, say 20 feet in thickness, 
may run like a curbstone set on edge for many miles across hills and in valleys. It may be a mile in depth and maintain a nearly uniform thickness, being perfectly distinct from the casing rock on each side of it, and keeping its distinctive character always, no matter how deep or how far into the earth it extends. Wherever it is bored into, gold and silver are found, but none in the meaner rock surrounding it. This peculiar rock formation is called a lead, and one of these you must first find before you have anything to locate a claim upon. When your prospecting has resulted in the discovery of a lead, you write out and put up a notice as follows. Notice. I, or we, the undersigned, claim one or more according to the number of the party, claim of three hundred feet, and one for discovery on this silver or gold, bearing quartz lead or load, extending east and west from this notice, with all its dips, spurs, and angles, extensions and sinuosities, together with fifty feet of ground on each side for working the same. Then you file a copy of the same with the mining recorder in the town, and your claim is entered. In order to secure it, however, you must, within ten days, do a certain amount of work upon the property, or anyone may re-enter it at the expiration of that time. Among the most important citizens in every mining community are the essayers, of whom there are generally a swarm to be found about every new strike. Some of them, the various charlatans that ever disgraced an honorable profession. When you have located your claim, the next thing is to select some specimens and subject them to the test of the fire essay. For this purpose, it is customary to select the richest lump you can find, and take it to the essayer. On the result of his essay, he will predict that a ton of such ore would yield hundreds, perhaps thousands of dollars, and in this way many a worthless mine has been sold for a large price. In fact, I think, as a rule, the speculators made far more than the miners themselves. We had at one time an essayer in our camp who obtained such rich results from every specimen of rock brought to him that he soon had a virtual monopoly of the business. No matter what specimen might be brought to him, he would demonstrate that it contained so large a portion of gold or silver that the development of the mine could not fail to be profitable. Some of his rivals in the trade becoming jealous of his superior success, conspired together and concocted a plan for his overthrow. One of them procured somewhere an old lapstone, and breaking it into small fragments, selected one as the specimen to be subjected to the intended victim for testing. They let several of the principal miners into the secret and as there had been some doubts of the reliability of the reports of the essayer in question, they readily assented to assist in proving the truth of the matter. So one of them brought him the specimen and left it for essay. The result was encouraging in the extreme, for in the course of an hour the essayer sent in his report, from which it appeared that a ton of rock equal to the sample would yield $1,324.80 in silver and $214.58 in gold. The whole matter was at once made public, and the discomfited charlatan immediately found that important business called him elsewhere, and departed between two days. It was well for him that he did so, for so great was the popular indignation that it is probable he would have found a permanent residence in the vicinity, could the excited miners have laid hands on him at this time. 
the town of Harding had now developed into an embryo city. We had nearly 2,000 inhabitants, representing every grade of civilization and barbarism, principally the latter. At night, the place presented an animated spectacle, for about every third shanty was either a drinking den or a gambling hell. All were brilliantly lighted and wide open to the street, from which you could see the excited groups around the gaming tables or before the bars. Every man went armed to the teeth. Fights and arrays were of almost daily, nay, hourly occurrence. The crack of the pistol became a very familiar sound in my ears, and so frequent were the scenes of violence and murder that I began to think that the men I was among were worse than the savages with whom my lot had been cast in former years. To such a pass did the insolence and brutality of these desperados come at last, that the better class of the miners began to talk among themselves of the necessity for doing something to check it, but none seemed disposed to take the lead, and things went on from bad to worse, until the arrival of a new actor upon the scene brought them to a climax and disorder and violence culminated in a sudden and severe spasm of justice. The new arrival, who was destined to be the principal figure in the tragic scenes about to be enacted, was a Kentuckian named Reed. He was some twenty-eight or thirty years of age, of medium size and finely proportioned, but very athletic. He had a frank and engaging expression of countenance, and nothing in his appearance would seem to indicate the hardened ruffian. Yet he was reported to have slain 32 men in a phrase or personal difficulties since he came into the mining country. From the very day of his arrival, this man became the acknowledged leader of all the lawless elements of our community and as he seemed to be thirsting for notoriety, outrage followed outrage in rapid succession. Among our own original party was a quiet, inoffensive German named Schaefer, than whom a more peaceable man could nowhere be found. Against him, Reed seemed to have a special spite from the moment he first encountered him, and finally, Meeting him one evening in the El Dorado Saloon, he forced a quarrel on him, and then shot poor Schaefer dead, before the latter had time to make a movement in his own defense. He apparently supposed that this would be passed over in the same manner as his previous ill deeds, but for once he was mistaken. In killing Schaefer, he had roused against him a determined and bitter enemy. None other than Ned Harding himself, who was now acting as mayor, or alcalde, of the town named in his honor. Ned quickly gathered together our own party and some twenty-five of the leading men in the place and announced his determination to form a vigilance committee and rid the town of the desperados who infested it. The entire party acquiesced in the wisdom of the proposal, and the committee was organized then and there. After some consultation, a plan of operations was agreed upon, and at once put in practice. The next morning, a neatly written note appeared posted in several prominent places in the camp, warning all objectionable characters to leave town within 24 hours, or their lives would be forfeited. This document was signed, The Vigilance, and naturally created considerable stir and excitement among the parties at whom it was directed, and many of them took the warning and departed. But some of the more desperate, in all about twenty in number, banded themselves together under the leadership of Reed, and swore that they would never leave town, except of their own free will, and defied the vigilance to touch any one of their number. 
At the expiration of the 24 hours, we determined to arrest all the members of Reed's party and deal with them as they deserved. Accordingly, we mustered our forces and at the same time made known our intentions to most of the more prominent men in the camp. When all our arrangements were completed, we proceeded in search of our game, and in a couple of hours had caught and caged every member of the gang, with two exceptions. One of these had in some way become aware of our intentions, and he found it convenient to seek another locality without delay. The other man was no less a person than Reed himself, and he went about boasting that no man dare arrest him, and threatening with instant death any man who should attempt it. This duty Ned Harding had reserved for himself, and when all was in readiness, he set out to accomplish it. As he was not known to be a vigilant, and was noted as a man of very quiet and peaceable character, no suspicion attached to him of being concerned in the matter. Arming himself, he went into the main street of the village, and entering one of the principal saloons, confronted the desperado. The latter must have seen in Ned's eye that he meant mischief, for he made a motion as if to draw a weapon, but before he could do so, he was seized by the throat and thrown to the ground with the full force of Ned's muscular arm. Other vigilants, to the number of about twenty, closed in around the fallen man and his captor, with drawn revolvers, and guarded against any attempt at rescue. Reed was securely bound, lifted to his feet, and placed in close confinement in one of the shanties belonging to our party, under the guard of two well-armed and determined men. Two hours later, all the prisoners were brought up for execution. The miners turned out in large numbers, and forming in solid column, armed to the teeth, they marched up the principal street and halted in front of the building where most of the prisoners were confined. The doomed men were quickly brought out and informed of the fate in store for them. At the same time, Ned Harding made his appearance, leading Reed, and the same announcement was made to the latter. Such a scene as ensued, I hope never to see again. These apparently fearless desperados, who had repeatedly imbrued their hands in human blood without an instant's hesitation, were transformed on the moment into a pack of whining cowards, begging and entreating in the most abject manner that their lives might be spared. Reed, the ringleader of all, was the most utter craven of the whole number, and shrieks, curses, and prayers for mercy rolled unceasingly from his lips until the rope choked his utterance. Just outside the camp stood a considerable grove of trees. To this we repaired with our prisoners, and in ten minutes more they were run up, one after another, and each hung convulsed in the death agony at the end of a lariat. To me, the utter cowardice displayed by these ruffians was surprising, but there is something about the desperado nature that is unaccountable. At least, it seems unaccountable. And it is this. The true desperado is gifted with splendid courage, and yet he will take the most infamous advantage of his enemy. Armed and free, he will stand up before a host and fight until he is cut to pieces. And yet, when brought under the gallows, he will plead and cry like a child. The case of Reed was especially notable. From his bloody reputation, and the many instances of courage he had shown in his conflicts with other outlaws, Yet, when brought face to face with death, 
in a different form, he seemed the veriest poltroon that ever walked. The words cost nothing, and it is easy to call him a coward. As all executed men who fail to die game are invariably called by unreasoning people, and when a man like Reed so exhausts himself by tears, prayers, and lamentations that he has scarcely strength enough to stand under the gallows, it seems hardly possible that he could be otherwise. Yet he had frequently defied and invited the vengeance of banded Rocky Mountain cutthroats by shooting down their comrades or leaders, and never offering to hide or fly. He had shown himself to be a man of unquestioned bravery, for no coward would dare do such things. We often read of the most brutal and cowardly murderers, who, when on the gallows, make their last dying speeches without a tremor of the voice, and are swung off into eternity with what seems like the calmest fortitude. Hence, it seems clear that in such low and degraded natures, it cannot be moral courage that sustains them. But if moral courage is not the requisite quality, what is it that such men as Reed lack? Bloody, desperate, reckless, and yet kindly mannered and urbane gentlemen, who never hesitate to warn their enemies of their intention to kill them on sight when next they meet. It seems to me a question worthy of study and solution. The execution's over. We return to the town, first detaching a party to remove and bury the bodies. Then the assemblage quietly dispersed, and that night... Our little community saw the first peace and quiet it had known for many a day. The condition of affairs in the new mining districts was peculiar. One reason why murder and outrage were so prevalent was that the rough element generally predominated, and among this class a person is not respected until he has killed his man, as they express it. When any new arrival came into camp, no one thought of inquiring if he was honest or industrious, but had he killed his man. If not, he was a person of small consequence and unworthy of further notice. If he had, the cordiality of his reception and his standing in the community was graduated according to the number of his victories. No man could rise to any position of influence with bloodless hands, without long and weary labor. But if he were known to have killed half a dozen men, his worth was at once appreciated, and he became a man of note in the community. Hence, it is not surprising that many men were killed without the pretext of provocation. So impatient were these persons to achieve distinction and emerge from their obscurity and become shining lights among the fraternity of desperados. There goes the man that killed Jack Smith, was the sort of celebrity mostly coveted by this class of people. And I know of several cases where persons tried to kill their men for no other reason, and in some instances were successful. In others, got killed themselves for their pains. In such communities, it is utterly impossible to convict a man of murder, arising from one of these public brawls or affrays, and it is only when patience ceases to be a virtue, and the long-suffering miners and others of the law-abiding classes rise in their might, and by an indiscriminate execution of all persons of bad character clear the atmosphere for a time that such crimes are ever punished. The desperado stalked the streets with a swagger, graded according to the number of his homicides, and a nod of recognition from him was sufficient to make an humble admirer happy for the rest of the day. 
the deference that was paid to a desperado of wide reputation and who kept his private graveyard, as the phrase went, was marked and cheerfully accorded. When he moved along the sidewalk in his excessively long-tailed frock coat, shiny stumped-toed boots, and with a dainty little slouch hat tipped over his left eye, the small fry ruffs made room for his majesty. When he entered the restaurant, the waiters deserted bankers and merchants to overwhelm him with obsequious attention. When he shouldered his way to the bar, the shouldered parties wheeled indignantly, recognized him, and apologized. They got a look in reply that made them tremble in their boots, and by this time, a gorgeous barkeeper was leaning over the counter, proud of a degree of acquaintance that enabled him to use such familiarity as, How are ya, Jack, old feller? Glad to see ya. What do ya take? The old thing? Meaning his usual drink, of course. The best known names in the mining towns were those belonging to these blood-stained heroes of the revolver. Governors, politicians, capitalists, leaders of the legislature, and men who made big strikes enjoyed some degree of fame, but it seemed local and insignificant when compared with the celebrity of such men as these. There was a long list of them, they were brave, reckless men, and carried their lives in their own hands. To do them justice, they did their killing principally among themselves, and seldom molested peaceable citizens, for they considered it small credit to add to their trophies so small an affair as the life of a man who was not on the shoot, as they termed it. They killed each other on slight provocation, and hoped and expected to be killed themselves, for they considered it almost disgraceful for a man not to die with his boots on, as they expressed it. Gradually, their ranks were thinned by the ever-ready pistol, but it was not so much this as the change in public sentiment that caused them mainly to disappear from the older mining communities. Now, except in newly opened diggings, the genuine desperado is a thing of the past. End of chapter 29、30. Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches an autobiography by Edwin Eastman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conclusion About this time, rumors were rife that the Indians were contemplating a raid on the mine and operations were temporarily suspended. Meetings were called, and a committee of defense organized, with a view to taking such measures as would place the settlement in a position to successfully resist all, or any attempts of the savages. Those who had had any experience in Indian warfare were called to the council, and consulted on the best means to avert the impending calamity. The panic was more painfully apparent among those who had come upon the scene hampered with goods and chattels of various kinds. These worthies were brimful of wrath and whiskey, and gave free vent to the expression of their opinions regarding the outside world generally, and Indians in particular. They were fertile in suggestion and the many schemes they advanced for the total destruction of all who threatened their private interest would have reflected credit, not to say renown, on a Don Quixote. The thought of my enslaved wife was never absent from my mind. Day and night, sleeping and waking, 
her image haunted me. I fancied her suffering every degree of misery, and the consciousness that I was powerless to snatch her from the toils of relentless captors caused me the most poignant anguish. I had a vague, half-formed notion of seeking her unaided, and by once more assuming my Indian trappings and cognomen, advance into the Apache country, penetrate to their villages, and by a bold dash seize my wife and bear her defiantly off in the very teeth of my adversaries. This would have been very spirited and chivalrous, no doubt, but unfortunately, the obstacles that opposed themselves to this plan were legion. No sooner did I convince myself of the impracticability of such a mode of procedure than other plans would present themselves, which, in their turn, would have to be relinquished when submitted to the rigorous test of practicability. This constant strain on my mind interposed stumbling blocks to my material prosperity, as I had no heart for my work and wandered about the diggings aimlessly. I was rallied by my comrades on my morose temper and recommended to try work as an effectual antidote for the causes that were preying on my health. One balmy afternoon, as I sauntered among the working parties, gazing abstractedly at their operations, my attention was attracted to a group who seemed to be very much excited by some event. A few had gathered about an object lying upon the ground, while others were running frantically in different directions as if they were possessed. My curiosity being excited, I approached the group and found that the cause of this alarm was one of their comrades, who had been bitten by a snake. The poor fellow was moaning piteously, and so sure was he that his death was only a matter of a few hours' time that he had begun to make the few bequests that would dispose of all his worldly goods, including that little hoard of dust so long and patiently sought for. One of his friends knelt at his side and was endeavoring to pour the contents of a flask of whiskey down his throat. The poison had taken immediate effect, and he doubtless would have been a corpse in a few hours. I was immediately recognized, and one of the miners accosted me with, Hello, Eastman. Just the man we want. Now is your time to produce some of those marvelous herbs you have told us about and see what you can do for this poor fellow. My sympathies were awakened. My mind threw off its semi-stupor, and hastily glancing about me on the ground, I sought for some of those simple herbs and plants that I had seen so effectually used in similar cases. Hastily gathering what I needed, I soon had leaves bandaged about the swollen parts and then turned my attention to making a decoction of the herbs. This I forced the patient to take, and after caring for him assiduously during a few hours, I had the satisfaction of noting a marked change for the better. I was deluged with congratulations, and in a short time, the fame of this new exploit and the healing art was noised abroad throughout the mine. My new friends were not miners, in the proper sense of the term, but a party of mountain men who had been allured hither by exaggerated reports of the immense wealth that was represented as scattered broadcast over the surface of the earth, and was only waiting for a claimant. Arriving on the ground, they had staked out a claim and fell to work without any delay. It is needless to add that they did not realize the immense riches they had so fondly anticipated. The result was that they had sickened of their bargain, and many were for pulling up stakes and returning to the free and easy life among the mountains. 
A short time after the episode just related, there came to our camp one day a trapper who had but just returned from his traps and was on his way to the nearest trading post to exchange his peltries for powder, wearing apparel, etc. From him we learned that the Indians were preparing for some extensive raid as he had seen numerous parties who were in their war paint. Among other items, he related how he had been captured by a hand of Apaches and had remained among them eight days before he succeeded in eluding the vigilance of his guard. From him, I gained the first information concerning my wife. He had been captured by some of Mato Chica's band, and by the description he gave of the white captives at the time in the village, I felt sure that my wife was one of the number. Learning that on his return he would proceed to the same locality in quest of beaver plue, I determined to accompany him. About half a dozen signified their intention of following my example, and a party was soon made up. The trapper bade us adieu, promising to return as soon as his skins were traded for the supplies of which he stood in need. Gathering together what little money I had, I purchased a horse, rifle, and pistol, and prepared to go in search of my lost wife. We had not long to wait for our new friend. He returned in less than a week's time, and all being in readiness, we gathered up our traps and took a final leave of the mine of San Ildefonso. Passing out at the northern end of the settlement, we struck the Santa Fe Road and followed its sinuous windings for some days. We passed through the sleepy Mexican towns that were situated along the route without disturbing in the least degree the habitual drowsiness of their inhabitants. On the fourth day we made a stretch of sixty miles through that terror of travelers in this section, the Hernando del Morto. After having crossed in safety, we rested one day to recuperate the animals, and soon after arrived in Santa Fe, halting at the inn that had been the scene of the shooting of Frey on my former visit. Our stay in the capital of New Mexico was not of long duration, and once more we resumed our journey, striking out in the westerly direction towards the mountains. Our first encampment was on the banks of one of the tributaries of the Rio Colorado. Staking our horses out, as is the custom, we gathered around the campfire, discussing our evening meal of fresh antelope steaks. Many were the stories told of trapper life, and as we filled our pipes for a smoke before retiring, the subject of conversation was upon food. All had some anecdote to relate, and after each had spun his yarn, Harding, who up to the present had been silent, drawled out. Well, I expect as how you have had some tolerable bad gents in your time, but I think I can just lay over anything in this here party in the way of supper. How's um ever? I'll give you a chance to hear how this nigger once got his supper up on the Yallerstone last season. You see, I had been in them parts arter beaver, which war plenty, and no mistaken, and all one day when I had gone to cache some skins, I left my rifle in the grass near my traps like a gosh darn fool. Who should come along but a party of them black niggers, the crows? And the first thing they sought eyes upon was my shooting iron. In course, I seed it all, and just had to lay low and cuss my tarnal stupidity, while them air crows hopped around like mad at finding my rifle and things. They was so pleased appeared like they forgot their sails, and didn't follow up on my trail, but galloped off, carrying my plunder along with them. <laughs> they mounted did as well, and let on hard and alone. 
I reckon that too, remarked one. Tain't like they made much out of that speculation. You see, I wore cleaned out and left with just a pair of leggings, better than 200 miles from any war. The company's post war the nearest, so I just took down the river in that direction. I never seen varmint so shy. They wouldn't have been, blast them, if I had or had my traps. But there wa'n't a critter, from the miners to the buffler, that didn't take on as if they'd known how this nigger war fixed. I could get nothing for two days but lizard and scarce at that. I chewed up the old leggings until I was naked as Pike's Peak. Golly, was it winter? No, twerk half time, and warm enough for that matter. I didn't mind the want of garments in that way, but I could have eaten more of it. I soon struck a town of sand rats, and I made snares of my hair and trapped some of them, but they grow shy too, cuss them, and I had to give up that claim. This war the third day, and I were getting powerful weak. I began to think this child time had come and I would have turned past in my chips. Twar a little arter sun up, and I was sitting on the bank when I seed something curious like floating downstream. When it came closer, I seed it were the carcass of a buffler and a couple of buzzards flopping about on the thing, picking its peepers out. Twar far out and the water deep, but I said I was going to fetch it ashore, and I did. I took to the water and swum out. I could smell the animal for our halfway. I were soon close up, and seen at a glimpse that the calf was as rotten as punk. The birds, they mizzled, and I wasn't going to have my swim for nothing, so I took a tail between my teeth. It wagged my flippers for the shore. I had made three strokes when the tail pulled out. I then swum round and pushed that earth thing afore me until I had got it high and dry on a sandbar. Twere like to melt when I pulled it out of the water. Twan't eatable know-how. I see the buzzards still flying about and fresh ones coming and I took an idea that I might get some, so I laid down close to the buffler and played possum. I want long there for a big cock come a-flopping up and lit on the carcage. I grabbed him by the leg. The cuss thing wore nearly as stinking as the other, but it were dyed dog, buzzard, or buffler, so I skinned the buzzard. And ate it, inquired one. No, slowly drawed the trapper. It ain't me. A general laugh followed this remark. The rest of the birds got shy and kept away on the other side. Twain't no use trying that dodge over again. Just then I spied a coyote coming lopping down the bank and another following upon his heels and two or three more on the same trail. I knowed it would be no joke gripping one of them by the leg, but I made up my mind to try it, and I laid down just as afore, side the calf. Twere no go. They smelled a rat and kept her clar. Then I took a fresh idea in my head. I went for some of the old driftwood and made a pen around the buffler and in the wink of an eye I had six of those varmints in the traps. Then you had them, eh, old boy, said one. You bet. I just took a lot of stones, clumped up on the pen, and killed the whole kid of them. Such as jumping in the island as when I was peppering them varmints. <laughs> Order this, I had some at to eat, and in a few days reached the company's post. Did you ever see any of those redskins again? I inquired. Well, you just better believe I did. 
You see those five notches on that zero rifle? Well, they stand for crows, they do. A general laugh followed this yarn, and all averred that his experience in the eating line was unequaled. After the trapper had finished his story, we wrapped ourselves in our blankets and were, with the exception of the horse guard, soon in a deep slumber. The next morning, we were up and moving at sunrise, and after a march of twenty miles, came to a small stream heading in the Pignon Range. It was fringed with cottonwood trees, and there was grass in abundance for our horses. We made a halt for an hour, and then proceeded on our journey. We had not gone far when we made a discovery that changed all our plans. Harding had been riding about a hundred yards ahead of the main party, when we observed him suddenly stop, bend down, and then throwing up his hands, beckon us on. We were soon up to the spot, asking in a breath what was the matter. He pointed to the ground and sententiously replied, Fresh engine sign. A consultation was held, and after an interchange of opinions, it was agreed that the trail was made by Apaches, and that from the trampled nature of the ground, it indicated the presence of a large party. We had no doubt as to their intentions. They were evidently bound south on their annual foray. Now was my time beyond peradventure. Never could I have had such another opportunity, perhaps even if I waited patiently for years. I briefly related to my companions the circumstances of my capture, captivity, and subsequent escape, and asked their aid in rescuing my wife. Each grasped me cordially by the hand and expressed their willingness to see me through, and after a few moments more spent in consultation, we agreed on the following plan. To push on at once and as speedily as possible for the Indian village, secrete ourselves in the adjacent mountains until nightfall, and then leaving the horses concealed in the bushes that fringe the base of the mountain, advance on foot to the chief's lodge. Once within its portal, it would be the work of a moment to seek out my wife, apprise her of what was transpiring, and quietly leading her out, hasten to our animals, mount, and ride away. This plan seemed feasible, and as moments were precious, we resumed the march. About noon, we debouched through the mountain pass into a country of openings. Small prairies, bounded by jungly forests, and interspersed with timber islands. These prairies were covered with tall grass, and buffalo signs appeared as we rode into them. We saw their roads, chips, and wallows. These signs filled us with pleasurable anticipations, as who has not longed for the delicious hump ribs, which, when once tasted in all their juicy richness, are never to be forgotten. The full-grown forms of the cacti were around us, bearing red and yellow fruit in abundance. We plucked the pears of the pitahaya and ate them greedily. In short, we dined on fruits and vegetables of many varieties, indigenous only to this wild region but our stomachs longed for the favorite food, and we pushed on through the openings. We had ridden about an hour among the chaparral, when Harding, who was riding in advance, pointed downward and intimated by signs that he had struck fresh buffalo tracks. Very soon after the animals came in view, and by using the bushes as cover, we made a very effectual surround, killing some three or four. That night, we regaled ourselves on buffalo, and the following morning pushed on with renewed vigor, 
and in the best of spirits. Near evening, on the fourth day following, we arrived at the foot of the Sierra, and directly in front of us, about midway up the valley, or pass, more properly speaking, lay the Apache village. An exclamation of joy escaped my lips. At last, then, the hopes and longings of nine weary years were about to be satisfied. My reflections were abruptly terminated by Harding, remarking that it was highly important that we seek cover and approach the village cautiously, if we expected our efforts to be crowned with success. All felt the justness of this observation, and seeking the cover of the mountain, we proceeded on our journey. In a short time we had advanced as near as we deemed it prudent, until the night should close in. Our reins were tightened, and we sat on our weary horses, looking over the plain. A magnificent panorama under any circumstances lay before us but its interest was heightened by the peculiar circumstances under which we viewed it. The lodges were dotted over the plain in picturesque profusion, the smoke curling gracefully up in their dreamy spirals. One lodge stood apart, and from its size and decorations, we at once guessed it to be the adobe of the chief. Harding confirmed our conjectures. Several droves of horses were quietly browsing on the open prairie. The sun was setting. The mountains were tinged with an amber-colored light, and the quartz crystal sparkled on the peaks of the southern Sierras. It was a scene of silent beauty. We remained for some time gazing up the valley, without anyone uttering his thoughts. It was the silence that precedes resolve. An hour has fled. The sun sinks below the horizon, and the mountains take on a somber hue. It is night. We urge our horses forward once more, keeping close to the mountain foot. Conversing in whispers, we crawl around and among the loose boulders that have fallen from above. And after an hour's ride, we find ourselves opposite the town. The night passes slowly and silently. One by one the fires are extinguished, and the plain is wrapped in the gloom of a moonless night. The swan utters its wild note. The gruya whoops over the stream, and the wolf howls on the skirts of the sleeping village. Dismounting, we gather in a little knot, and consult as to what plan we shall pursue. It is finally determined that Harding and myself shall penetrate into the village, enter the chief's lodge, abduct my wife, and hastily rejoin our comrades, who will hold themselves in readiness to cover our retreat, and if the worst comes to the worst, Keep our pursuers at bay until we have made good our escape. Hastily divesting ourselves of all unnecessary accoutrements, we started out on the plain and cautiously approached the chief's lodge, which loomed up in the darkness like some hideous genii. An Indian dog that was lurking about the door gave the alarm. But Harding's knife entered his vitals ere he could repeat it. Now was the critical moment. Drawing the flap aside that served as a door, I peered cautiously in. All was silent. A small fire was burning in the center of the lodge, its fitful gleam dimly illuminating the interior. A number of low couches were ranged around the wall. But at this juncture a dilemma presented itself. Here were a number of women, one of when was certainly my wife, but how was I to ascertain in which of these couches she reposed? If I should trust to chance, 
advance to the first one and peer in, and by doing so startle its inmate. Even though that inmate were my wife, the peculiar nature of the visit would so startle her that she would not be enabled to recognize the intruder. However, I determined to approach the first bed and trust to the chapter of accidents for the rest. Advancing noiselessly to the side of the couch, I lifted the curtain of dressed buffalo hide. The fire cast a dim light over the face of the sleeper, and oh, joy, it was the loved features of my wife. I tried to speak, whisper her name, my tongue clove to the roof of my mouth. I trembled like an aspen and had to grasp the bed for support. This movement awakened the sleeper, and with an half-suppressed exclamation, she sprung to a sitting posture. To breathe her name, clasp her in my arms, and rush for the door was the work of an instant, and hastily snatching a robe that was suspended from the side of the lodge, I enveloped her in it and rapidly gained the cover of the mountain. In a few moments, our party was in full gallop down the valley. Leaving the Indian village, we started with all speed on our return. I did not anticipate pursuit, and we made no attempt to conceal our trail. Indeed, my mind was so occupied with the grand fact that I had recovered my long-lost darling that I thought of nothing else. As we rode along, each recounted to the other the story of their toils, trials, and sufferings. A thousand questions were asked and answered, and in the joy of the present and hope for the future, we were for a time happy. About the middle of the forenoon, we approached a thick chaparral, and were just entering it when a party of about sixty Apaches suddenly rushed out from its leafy coverts, and with the rapidity of thought, we were surrounded and captured. My wife was able, by her influence with the leader of the party, to save us from indignity, and a lengthy parley followed. I made known to the chief my desire to recover my wife, and endeavored to arrange some terms of purchase or barter. In this I was, after a time, successful, and after an indeterminable siege of pipe-smoking and discussion, relative to the price, we came to terms, and in a few minutes I had purchased my wife at the cost of all my worldly possessions. But I cared not for this. On the contrary, I was only too glad to recover my wife at any cost, and felt no regret at parting from the accumulations of two years of toil and hardship. Resuming our journey, we reached Santa Fe in safety in a few days, and commenced making preparations for our return to the east. The kind-hearted Mexican woman overwhelmed my wife with attentions, and she was soon provided with apparel more suitable than the barbaric, although beautiful, Indian costume. My principal difficulty was the want of money, and I was much perplexed to know how to secure a sufficient sum to enable us to return to our friends. It is probable that had I freely stated our circumstances, and narrated our sad story, generous hearts might have been found among the many American miners and trappers sojourning in the town, for many a noble heart beats beneath a rough and uncompromising exterior. But my pride shrank from appearing in the character of a mendicant, and I finally came to the conclusion that we must remain in Santa Fe for a time, until I could find some employment by which to earn sufficient means to enable us to return to our former home. I had forgotten the fact that I possessed a warm friend in Ned Harding, or, 
if I had thought of him in this connection. It was not with any idea that he could aid me. In this I was mistaken, as the sequel will show. On the third morning after my return, Ned called me out under the pretense of taking a walk, and after strolling about for a time in silence, he opened his mind as follows. Well, lad, what are you going to do next? I suppose you don't intend to stay here in this er godforsaken hole that these yarra bellies call the city. The Lord forgive their ignorance, if they could only see London once. Well, as I was saying, you can't stay here, and you can't take your little girl back to the mining country very well. So what do you mean to do? Let old Ned know, and don't go round, keeping as close as an ister and never saying nothing to nobody. Thus admonished, I forgot my reserve and fully explained to him my dilemma. He listened in silence until I had finished, and then broke forth with, Why, Lord bless ye, lad! Yet are getting foolish, certain! <laughs> your little woman has turned her head. Sure! Why, you forgot all about the mine, and I reckon there's valley enough that to send ye home like a nabob, if you like to travel that way. The mine! I exclaimed in surprise. Why, Ned, I thought we had abandoned it altogether. You don't mean to tell me that I can realize anything from the claim. You bet I mean just that, said Harding, his features expanding into a broad grin as he marked my look of utter astonishment. Why, lad, if we were all agreed on the thing, I've got a party here that'll give us five thousand apiece for our cream. I ain't such a fool as I look, and it want for nothing that I left Pete there holding possession, and there he'll stay till he hears for me. So now, if you're willing to take five thousand for your share, just say the word, and we'll have it settled in no time. Further inquiry elicited the information that during the two days previous, while I had spent my time in unprofitable cogitation, Ned had been kind of prospecting round among the speculators, as he termed it, and had found parties willing and anxious to buy the claim held jointly by Ned, Pete Jackson, and myself for $15,000 in cash. Ned had brought with him some specimens of the quartz, which he had shown to the intending purchasers, and some of which they had subjected to essay, and the result of this had determined them to buy the claim if everything could be satisfactorily arranged. It did not take me long to decide. In fact, I fairly jumped at the offer. The sum mentioned seemed a princely fortune at the time, and in fact, to one in my situation, it really was so for wealth is but comparative, after all. The following morning, the trade was arranged, the necessary papers drawn up, and Ned left the same afternoon for the mine in company with the buyers, to deliver the property and complete the transaction. In a few days he returned, and I soon found myself in possession of $5,000 in gold coin the largest amount of money I ever owned. I now hurried the preparations for our departure, and a few days later rejoined an eastward-bound train and journeyed with it towards the rising sun. With the details of our journey, I will not weary the reader. Suffice it to say that we made the trip without trouble or molestation of any sort and reached St. Louis in safety. How strange it all seemed to walk about the streets of the great city of the West, and as the residents fondly term it, the future great city of the world. Everything seemed so unreal. After the long years of my captivity and wild life among the mountains, that I used sometimes to fancy that it was all but a dream, and I would presently awake to find myself again in the temple with Watko Mekla, in that strange, 
and far-off land hidden among the mighty mountains of the Sierra Madre. We remained but a few days in the metropolis of the West, and then journeyed to a point further eastward, where my wife had relatives living, or at least supposed that some might yet be surviving. On our arrival, we found such to be the case, and a joyful reunion was the result, we being received as two risen from the dead. And now, our cup of happiness was indeed full, reunited after so long a separation and such bitter suffering we had returned at last to friends and home. In conclusion, I can only express my thanks to those kind readers who have followed me patiently through all my wanderings and listened to my simple, yet I hope not uninteresting narrative of the hardships and perils through which I have passed. If the story of our captivity has proved a source of entertainment to the reader, if it happily excites a feeling of sympathy and interest for the many wretched captives who yet remain in the servitude worse than death among the rude tribes of the West, if it renders the general public more familiar with the region of which so little is known, if should chance to afford to those officials of our government, to whom the subject is regulated, any new views in reference to the proper method of dealing with the Indians, if it accomplishes any of these ends, I shall be more than repaid for my labor in its preparation. My thanks are also due to my kind friend, Dr. Clark Johnson, without whom opportune aid this book would never have been written. And now, kind reader, for the present at least, farewell. End of Seven and Nine Years Among the Comanches and Apaches An Autobiography by Edwin Eastman Audiobook Recording by Claude Stewart